Good evening, everyone. It sure is great to have everyone here. A little bit cooler weather today. Uh, not cool, but just a little bit cooler. Uh, so we're thankful that everyone's out. We're thankful we got this air conditioning unit working real well for us now. And we're real thankful to be cons uh, continuing our summer series this week. We have Gary McDade here with us today and his wife, Sheila. We're glad to have them from uh, Browns Ferry. And uh, it is a, is a pleasure. We... Uh, we definitely want to encourage everyone to pay attention, and uh, Gary's going to have a good class for us, and I'm not going to take up any more of his time. Gary, I welcome you to the stage. Well, good evening, everyone. It's sure good to be with you all. Great to be with you tonight. Thank you for the invitation to come. I'm glad to get to be. It's been about a year since I've been here with you. Time goes by too fast, but I'm glad that it does because now we're together again tonight. Well, I asked uh, Brother Kirk if it'd be all right if I mentioned something about our media work that we do, the television program. I know uh, some of you watch the Everlasting Gospel on Sunday afternoon. Now, that's a television program, and Jason, my son that you know well, says, Dad, you've got a face for radio. <laughs> so I can't argue with him there. We're on the radio also, but I wanted you to know about that. We're looking for congregations that will help us by supporting the program, maybe a couple hundred dollars a month, and we're looking for 17 congregations, so we can continue that next year. We've been doing this for about six years now, and uh, we like to have congregations that are excited about it. Where we are at Browns Ferry Road, it's our work. And so what happens is, if I preach a lesson from the pulpit that's good, that happens every once in a while. Somebody will say, that needs to be on television. So, okay, that's the one that goes on TV. So we work together like that in our program. If they say, here's a lesson that needs to be presented, I take that to the TV and the radio. So we work together on getting the message out there as best we know how. We're having a lot of fun with it. And we appreciate you guys watching the Everlasting Gospel. It's also on the radio. I've got some newsletters I intended to bring, but maybe I can mail them to you and you can see where all you can find television program. Jason helped us in that. We enjoy working together. Sheila's my producer for the TV, and she really likes that because for 30 minutes, she can tell me exactly what to do, where to look, what to say, <laughs> stop, do it again. <laughs> but that's just why we're doing the TV program. But that's at least 30 minutes a week that she employs. And I appreciate her. She does an excellent job working with her. Well, tonight I've been assigned a topic for the summer series, and it's a pretty straightforward topic. Pretty needed topic. I don't know if you've looked at the list uh, or not this week, but my topic that I've been assigned is adultery, fornication, and premarital affair. Pretty heavy, right? That's pretty heavy. Well, we want to discuss that a little bit tonight and see if we can benefit from the study. You know, we're living in a society that has become very much like ancient foreign. I don't know if you've gone back and studied the historical background of the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians or not, but when you do, you come to find out there's a lot of sin in Corinth. It was a cosmopolitan city, kind of the crossroads of the world. It's on a major trade route. People were coming and going all the time there. And as a result, it not only brought in all the industry and commerce, but it additionally brought in all of the sin and vileness and graft and wickedness in society. And you can see that a little bit in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And this is where I wanted to start tonight is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. And the reason I wanted to begin with this passage is because it, it puts a uh, surrounding around the topic of adultery, fornication, and premarital relations. By not only telling us how bad it is to be participating in a wicked way in those things, but also it gives us hope for those who are tied up in those things and those who have made mistakes in life. <clears throat> Let's look at that. It's on page one, 1366. It's 1 Corinthians 6, 9. In this passage, Paul wrote, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. In preparing this lesson, I've got, I want to read the rest of these, but I'd like to give you this little footnote here if I could. I've got two passages I'd like to look at that will be the body of the lesson. One is in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 23, all the way through 727. 
And the second one is in the New Testament in Ephesians 5, 17, or rather 4, 17 through 5, 17. But in reading those passages of Scripture, you can't help but think about this thing of deception. Because so many are deceived when it comes to adultery, fornication, and premarital relations. They're deceived about it. And it's easy to think that what the Bible teaches on it, oh, it applies maybe to everybody else, but it doesn't apply to me. I'm not going to suffer any adverse consequences from those actions. And so this idea of deception that begins this list is very important for us to see because it is a tendency that is one of the most powerful and most used tools of Satan, and that is deception, to deceive and to trick. He's excellent at that. He's a liar and the father of lies, John 4, verse 88. He has many tricks or methods that he uses, Ephesians 6, 10 and 5. So I just wanted to sort of lay the groundwork in our thinking. If tonight's lesson is going to benefit us, and we know that it can, to know the power of deception and Paul saying, be not deceived, don't be tricked. And then he has this list. Neither fornicators. You see, that's my topic. That has to do with sexual immorality. Fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. See, I'm right on topic. And watch. Nor effeminates. That's going to be a man acting like a woman. Homosexual. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. We have, I think, five letters for that in our society. LGBTQ. Everybody knows what that is, but not everybody knows what effeminates and abusers of themselves with mankind means. Well, that's what that is. Don't be deceived about it. <clears throat> Further, he says, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. And then this statement, this phrase, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be tricked about it. You may think you can be involved in homosexuality, lesbianism. You may think you can be involved in premarital sex and fornication and adultery and somehow escape. It's always done. There's always a rationalization. I won't tell you any names because I don't want to wind up in jail, but we had a person come to us and say, I was in an unscriptural relationship. I was married and I committed adultery. I don't have the right to marry. Well, we'll surround you with love. We'll be your family. We'll encourage you to live faithfully to God. We'll be your companions. You labor and work with us. Later down the road, same person goes to another congregation and says, you know what? I think I have a right to marry. And she said, my first husband committed adultery and then I committed adultery. And since he did it first, that freed me to commit adultery. Neither one of them had been divorced. That's false. And Jesus said, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another, except it be for fornication, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. It anticipates an innocent party putting away a guilty party. When both of you are guilty, you do not have the right to remarry. Don't be deceived about it. Because now that woman has married an older man with a good amount of money and saw a lot of incentive, and as a result of that, now they're married. They're in a local congregation of the people of God. You're going to be deceived about that, or you're just going to be quiet about it? First Corinthians chapter 4, there was a person in open adultery like that. And Paul said, you need to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Verse 14. You can't be tricked or deceived about that or just because you love somebody. We love all of the parties I've just mentioned. Very much. You're not the one who makes the rules. You don't get to give them a pass on what God has taught in that regard. And this phrase here is very stirring. Shall, it, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. If you're in any of those lists in that category, it's not serious. <laughs> Even our young people are impacted by this. I had a young girl in our Bible club and we could have one before the pandemic. The middle schoolers, you know, grades six, seven, and eight, were meeting at lunchtime and everybody's kind of getting their lunch and coming in the teacher's room that let us meet in her room. 
getting settled, and we would have about maybe 20, 15 to 20 solid minutes of good Bible instruction. And so this girl I had not seen before, a sixth grader comes in. I don't notice it. The teacher, teacher later called to my mind, she had a dog collar around her neck. Well, I don't know how people press. I don't know what that meant. But she's standing on one side of the desk. I'm standing on the other. She said, I got a question for you. And I said, what is it? She said, is this an LGBTQ friendly space? 12-year-old asking me that question. I asked her, how do you define LGBTQ? Do you know what you're talking about? She said, well, yeah, it's, uh, it involves transgender, and that's what I am. I said, you are transgender? I'll just tell you, we lived on the street in Memphis. A couple little girls down the street had a puppy. And they come down the street. I know all the kids on the street. A couple of them, granddaughter played there in the little mall, worked on their bicycles, all of that. The little girls came down with this little, looked like a cocker spaniel, old black little puppy. And they said, we want to name our puppy, but we don't know if it's a boy or a girl. And we need you to tell us. I said, give me that puppy. So I took the puppy and turned it upside down and handed it back to them. And they said, I said, what did you want to name your puppy? They said, we want to name it Maria. I said, you can name her Maria because she's a girl. And they said, well, how do you know she's a girl? I said, all you got to do is look at the bottom of it. <laughs> so I'm thinking about that while this little girl is telling me she's transgender. I said, how do you know you're transgender? Well, just the other day, I just realized I'm transgender. Well, it's obviously a philosophical thought that she has in her mind where she's being impacted from this society. She wanted to know if it's LGBTQ friendly space. I told her, let me tell you something. If you're thinking that way, this is right where you need to be because we're going to be looking at the Bible and what God says about things like that and you need to know it. Oh, okay, we'll do it. She was with us through the whole school. Well, that's the society that we live in. These passages of Scripture say you can't inherit the kingdom of God. Now watch this in verse 11. And such were some of you. They can change. You ever heard a homosexual can't change? Well, these people were homosexuals, and guess what? They can change. The Bible says that. Such were some of you. But you're washed. The only washing in the New Testament is baptism. Acts 22, 16. And now why tarriest thou rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The washing. You were washed. They were baptized. They had sins washed away. They turned away from that lifestyle. That's why I don't hesitate to talk about it. You don't have to be stuck in a lifestyle that's going to cost you your soul. You can repent and return to God. You can do God's will. Such were some of you, but you're washed. You're sanctified. That means set apart as holy. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I wanted to begin there tonight to talk about the subject of adultery, fornication, and premarital relationships. Now, I'd like to mention to you that we have passages of Scripture in abundance on these topics, but I wanted you to get some verses of Scripture that later when you think about it, you can go back and read for yourself and study for yourself. That's why I gave the verses... I mentioned to you a minute ago in Proverbs and in Ephesians. So if you would, turn with me to Proverbs. <laughs> as you're turning to Proverbs, as the story goes, a young girl came to her mother and said, Mom, I'm going out on my first date with a boy. He is able to drive his own car. And we're going out by ourselves. And the mother said, all right. Here's what's going to happen. We'll take you out to dinner. You're going to have a good meal somewhere. Then you're going to go play putt-putt or something. And mom's not going to worry about you. And then it's going to be time for you to come home. Because you're going to be back here too. It's going to be time for you to come back home. And you're going to be driving back home. And he's going to say, you know, here's a nice place for us to pull off the road and just talk for a little while. Mama's not going to worry about you at that point. She said, and he's going to tell you now, look, um, why don't you just scoot over here a little closer to me so that we can be more friendly and, and talk here on our day. And mama's not going to worry about you. Is that right? But then he's going to say, now, why don't you let me put my arm around you? 
mothers don't worry about it. Right. Sure enough, she goes on the day. Guy takes her, gets something nice to eat, he goes to play putt putt. She's a girl, so she lets him win. She's a smart girl. She lets him win. And then it's time to go back home, and they're driving along, and he says, you know, here's a good place to pull over and just talk for a little while. And she says, man, my mother's smart. And she knows that. She knows that. The mama's not worried about the mother. And then they're sitting there talking for a minute, and he says, why don't you scoot over here close to me? She said, oh, no. You scoot over here next to me and let your mother worry about you. That's what you do. <laughs> In the book of Proverbs, you have behavior patterns that are set out. And they are what you would style explicit because it's a book of wisdom. Solomon didn't want to write and you not know what he's talking about. So he's going to break it down. The book of Proverbs is a book for our children, for parents to teach their children, to talk to them about things they need to hear from the inspired word of God in a dignified and honorable way. Let's look at Proverbs starting with chapter 6. Let's drop back up to verse 20 if we might. My son, keep thy father's commandments and forsake not the law of thy mother. Mom and dad have your best interests at heart. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. We need to value our godly training always. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. And when thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. You ever hear somebody saying, Oh, I hear my mom's voice or my dad's voice in my ear. Sure, we do that. My dad's been gone about five years. We used to talk every day. I always think about what my dad said on certain things because he was such a joy. Let them talk to you. Remind, be reminded of what they taught you that's good for you. Value that upbringing and that teaching. That's what the wise man is instructed. Verse 23. For the command, excuse me, for the commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. You just have that. We have to be corrected as we go through life. We never outlive that need. The way of life is associated with instructions. Proofs of instruction of instruction are the way of life. The Bible is given for that. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction. For instruction in righteousness. Second Timothy 3, 17. That's the way of life. That's why we continue to study the Bible. So that we can be properly instructed. It's the way of life. So don't think that because we're having a lesson about the subject of adultery fornication and premarital relationships. That it's something that's only incidental or a one time deal. No, this is something that characterizes Further, he goes on to say, verse 24, the purpose of it, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. No man needs this right here. This, right this instruction is to keep you from falling astray to an evil woman, the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. And he's going to spell that out and give us a picture of that in just a minute as to what he means. But now he goes on to say in verse 25, just now at this point, Lust not after her beauty in thy heart, neither let her take thee with, thy, with her eyelids. Don't lust after her beauty in your heart. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus is laying the groundwork for what his kingdom is going to be like, he says, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already, in his heart. Let me tell you, young ladies, you don't want to be a part of that. You don't want the, the, the damnation of a man's soul on your record. What are you talking about? Why you do this? In First Timothy chapter 2, the young women are to be adorned with moderate apparel. Modest apparel. That is, you don't call attention to yourself. The best way to do that is wear a pair of short pants that are so short that when you wear a t-shirt, the men can't tell whether you got on pants or not. Now what happened? Look on a woman to lust after her. Now young girls, let me say something. I see this. People walking into Walmart dressed like I just described. And mama walking right along beside her just like there's no problem whatsoever. Are you serious? Mama knows. 
Mama knows. But she doesn't have the ability to instruct her child in the manner in which she's dressed in such a way as to show the dignity that is associated with her body and have her carry that into the public arena. What we're talking about here is the instruction of the way of life. The fruits are the way of life. We need to correct that. Because watch this. You may not even know when that man looked upon you with lust in his heart and committed adultery with you in his heart. That sin unrepented of will cause that man to burn in hell forever and ever in a place where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth because you wanted to wear them shorts and that t-shirt just like all the other girls since they're doing it. And since everybody's doing it, you wanted to do it. You think you will be without judgment when the Lord returns? Or causing a man to spend eternity in a devil's hell? Yeah, you'll be right there responsible. That the young women are to adorn themselves in the bonds of hell. Shame faces survive. Again, remember that discussion I had a minute ago about be not deceived? Don't trick yourself about it. Don't say it's no big deal. It's a big deal. Don't say it won't happen. It happens. We want to display a respect for ourselves that carries the dignity that we have into society. We need that. We used to sing a song when I was a kid based on Matthew 5, 16, where Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We'd sing this little Christian light of mine. Don't hide it under a bushel. Don't let Satan blow it out. You let it shine. You do that in the manner of your dress as much as in anything you could ever say. So it's really important. In giving these instructions, the wise man says that. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart. Neither let her take thee with her eyelids. You can just see her batting those eyes. Oh, I want you to notice me. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Well, it looks like it's predatory. Doesn't it? Here she's using her beauty to take advantage of a man to the degree that he'll be brought to a piece of bread. You know what that means? Why not with nothing but just a morsel of bread to eat? It'll destroy any prospects you have of prosperity to focus your attention toward this whorish woman. It's been the destruction of many marriages and many men's personal lives. You're being cautioned against that as a young person right here in Proverbs. Watch this, 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? When I was a boy, we used to uh, like to go shoot firecrackers and have to go down the Wolf River there by Memphis to do that. And I had a buddy who was always mischievous. So we're down the bank there by the water popping firecrackers where we'll start a fire. He's up on the bank. Guess what he's doing? He's lighting his firecrackers and dropping them on us. He got enjoyment out of that. I didn't. Especially when one of them went right in my pocket. You ever try to get a firecracker out of your pocket? It's the fastest you'll move in the water. I'll tell you that. I got the firecracker out and it popped right now. What a blast we had doing those fires. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? No. He's going to be burned. Don't, don't be tricked about it. Every man that's taken in by his deceit, he thinks, well, that won't happen to me. I would never suffer adverse consequences by not heeding the word of God or what it teaches regarding adultery, fornication, and free marriage. He goes on. Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? You ever do that? When I was a boy, we always went barefooted in the summer. Yeah, that's old school. We go barefooted in the summer. We live behind the store, and they paved the parking lot in the store. So I go walking over to the store, black asphalt. It is hot. I can't stand it. So I'm running. I see a milk carton. They used to have a, you know, they still have some of the milk in the cartons that were whacked. Paper. And this one has been there, run over by all the cars, where it's a white spot right there on the parking lot. And my feet are in sports. I'm running over and I thought that looks like it would be cool. And I jumped with both feet on that white milk. It was about 10 times hotter than the day. So I didn't stay very long. Got all for that. You think you can walk on hot coals and your feet not be burned? All of these imagery to let us know, don't you let yourself be tricked about this. Don't be deceived about this. He's telling you what is right. Verse 29. 
So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he's hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, and he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest him many gifts. You can steal from a guy. You can apologize and take it back and restore it. Make sure he's made whole and you're sincere and genuine about that. He may come to accept your apology, especially when you get into step one. If you commit adultery with his wife, you better watch it. This is what he's saying. You better watch your wife. If he decides he's going to take vengeance, he won't stop until he has done it. He's telling you things here that will keep you out of some deep trouble. A lot of difference in stealing a man's possession and stealing his wife. And we got brethren today who will say, well, once a guy has, uh, no matter how the divorce ended, and this woman married to another man, and she's now baptized, they can be married. Had he stole his pickup truck, would he need to take that pickup truck back? Would he need to show repentance? Well, that's what the Solomon just said. You think he thinks more of his pickup truck than he does his wife? Whoever came up with that doctrine that baptism just washes it all away there and all the guilt and responsibility of the adulterous relationship, and you can be married to whoever you want to. That's as false as the day is one. Be like saying, I stole your pickup truck. But I got news for you. I was baptized last night and I'm keeping your pickup truck. Well, anybody will tell you that baptism didn't do you any good, son. You hadn't repented. Repentance is bringing forth fruit, needful repentance, worthy of repentance, showing repentance, Matthew 3 8. You hadn't repented. All you did was get wet. You think you can keep a man's wife? What line of reasoning allows that? None. Now in chapter 7, and we want to read down through verse 23 here. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. And my law is the apple of thine eye. That phrase, the apple of thine eye, is something that you treasure, something that you value very highly. Keep my law in a treasured place in your thinking. Bind them upon thy fingers and write them upon the table of thy heart. You remember in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 6, Moses instructed the children of Israel to teach their children and to write this law on the doorposts of their house and on thy gates. Talk to the children about it when they rise up and when they lie down. Let them be as frontlets between thine eyes. Make sure they know God's will. Now the wise man says, I'll tell you where you need to write them. You need to write them on your heart. And by heart, he means mind, the way you think needs to be guided by the commandments of God. That's what he's talking about in these passages. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kindred. You know, you can see that in camp with little kids. I know y'all got some young people at camp this week. Some of ours just got back from a couple of weeks at camp. I've been a counselor at camp for many years in the past. You can see some of the kids are wise about stuff. Some are not so wise. But a wise child will really stand out. You know what happens sometimes when you recognize that? They're close with their dad or their mom. And they've been listening to what they've got to say. Sometimes they're close with their grandparents. And they have good judgment of that. I'm talking about young kids. Kids that are just old enough to go to camp. You can display a level of discretion and wisdom if you have these values. Say to wisdom, thou art my sister. You're going to be with me like a blood relative. And call understanding thy kindred woman. I'm going to be a person of understanding and manifest the knowledge of the ways of life that please God. That they may keep thee from the strange woman and from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Now she's going to flatter you. She's going to try to talk you out of all these values. Young ladies, he's going to try to talk you out of all these values. You love me, don't you? He's going to try to talk you out of all of them. That's what this man is pointing to. 
the inspired man as he writes to us. And behold, among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man, void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went away to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. I wonder what kind of attire I just described earlier about those shorts and the t-shirt where you can't tell if a woman wearing pants. How would, how would a, the attire of a harlot differ from that? If you want to advertise your wares and you're a horse woman or a harlot, how would you advertise in any way that could be possibly beat that? I mean, you got to have some clothes on and you get arrested, right? I mean, I assume you might. I don't know that you would. So here's this guy, void of understanding. He's watching. Sees him go right down to her corner. She's standing on the place where harlots stand, and she is dressed with the attire of a harlot. And he's just observing what happens. And he's sharing that with us. He says, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. It's like she's on some kind of a drug. She can't sit still. She wanted to capture a man. So she caught him and kissed him. And with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vow. You think she's a religious woman? He's already tricked. Oh yeah, I meant this night. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy faith, and I, face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with cover. What do you think she was waiting on that particular person that's the dull of understanding? The next guy, whoever the next guy was, the guy she's talking to. But she's making him, he's tricked. He's deceived. He's thinking, oh, I'm special for her. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry and with carved works and with fine linen of Egypt. I perfume my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. Loves. For the good man is not at home, he's gone on a long journey. Oh, wait a minute, you're married? Oh yeah, but he's not here. He's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. He's not due to come in for a long time. Don't worry about him. With her much fair speech, she calls a country demon. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as a fox dumb to this, or as a fool to the correction of the slaughter. Now, you know what an ox is going through the slaughter. Sheila and I had a mortgage company in Memphis, and we did a loan one time for a guy. You know what his job was? What do you do for a living? I can't even get your information. What do you do for a living? You work at the slaughterhouse? Okay, what do you do at the slaughterhouse? What's your occupation? I work on the stun line. You work on the stun line? Are you telling me you swing a sledgehammer, hit cows in the head all day? Okay, I'll put that down stun there. It sounds better than that. I said, you've got to be the most relaxed man I've ever met in my life. You can have no frustration. You work out everything at work. Killing cows all day. I don't know what I'll get. Oh, how would that do that? Well, we know what killing an ox is. And that's the way this guy is, walking into this harlot's life. Letting her come in to get. Or walking into the stun line. Bam, knock you out. But what is this fool to the stocks? They used to take people and they had stock. There were big, huge pieces of wood with holes in them. Sometimes it was for the hands and enough for the head, and they would put your hands and head there and they put that stock down and lock it. You, you're not getting out. You're not getting out. And they would do this to adulterers back, and even in this country, put you in the stocks. You would be there, and that's where they get the word. You ever heard of laughing stock? People would come by and mock and ridicule and make fun of. The actions on the part of this person because he was so stupid as to do something like he was guilty of doing. And that's what he's telling us about. And he says, a fool to the correction of the stuff. The idea is make him think twice before he goes and commits adultery with some other man's wife. 
till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend unto the words of my mouth. O ye children, yeah, this is the kind of thing our children need to be hearing, ladies and gentlemen. Our children need to be hearing this at home from mom and dad, whom they can trust and they know, and know that they're telling them exactly what they need to know in order to live a life that is without pain, guilt, and remorse and regrets. O children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Notice, decline to her. When you decline, what are you doing? You're going down. Don't let your heart go down to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Don't think you're special. She was the next guy. Her house is the way to hell. Now, is there any misunderstanding about what we're talking about? Her house is the way to hell. If you want to go to hell, you just get involved in that kind of lifestyle. Adultery, fornication, premarital relationships. Her house is the way to hell. There's not any words in the English language that can make what we're discussing tonight plainer than that. Her house is the way to hell. Going down to the chambers of death. I wanted you to get that because it's Proverbs. A book of wisdom. I think that's why we're here today. If we want to know God's will, we have to be wise about the things of God. Well, I think we've hit the nail on the head by going to Proverbs on this subject tonight. But before we leave it, I want to go over the New Testament to Ephesians chapter 4, as I mentioned, verse 17. I think I've got maybe about seven minutes. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. And let's start at verse 17. Now let me hear Ephesians 4 is on page 1319. In Ephesians chapter 4, you have emphasis about there's one God, one Father. There's one Lord Jesus Christ. There's one Holy Spirit. There's one body. The seven ones. Then he will talk about how God designed the church for its strengthening and its upbuilding, the edification of the body in love. So he's talking about all those good things. But we should always be speaking the truth in love for the purpose of growing up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. To the working, uh, to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make an increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. Right, that's what he's talking about. How the body of Christ can grow and strengthen, be made strong and mature through the teaching of the Word of God, love of the truth, and practicing of the truth. And now then, he's going to vote to devote the next verses to telling us what not what they're wanting. You can't have the edifying, the building up of the church without avoiding the things we've been talking about. Adultery, fornication, premarital relationships. Look at what he said. This is Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore, because you want the church to be strong, because you want the church to reflect the glory of God, Ephesians 3, 21, therefore, I testify in the Lord as an inspired apostle that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. Vanity of their minds is empty headed. They don't have this quality of wisdom we've been urging tonight. And we've been benefiting from studying and been painted and gained just from our study so far tonight. The vanity of their minds. They're empty headed. Don't be walking like them. Having the understanding darkened. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness and to work all uncleanness with greediness. That's what we've been talking about. You know what lasciviousness is? It is lustful bodily movements. And he's saying don't, don't do that. They are past feeling. They can't be pricked with a lesson. They can't be shamed into understanding a wicked lifestyle and how it should be avoided. They can't be coached and coached out of it by showing the glorious hope of heaven and a wondrous relationship within the body of Christ 
with brothers and sisters wanting to do God's will in his past days. They've been involved in that lifestyle so long. And Paul is saying, let's don't do like them. It's a choice that we make as to how we are. Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. And you have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation or manner of life the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. In the angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearer. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, for by your seal unto the day of redemption, that all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering of a sweet savor unto God, an offering of a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. But fornication, our subject, and all uncleanness, or covetousness, greediness, let it not once be named among you that become a saint. Neither filthiness, or foolish talking, or jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving the thanks. For this ye know, you know this, that no foreman, nor unclean person, or covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That's the second time Paul has said that. First time was 1 Corinthians 6, 6, 10, 10. Watch this, verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your kind attention to the lesson tonight. I hope you'll remember those verses if you'd like to go back and study them. We can apply them and take that away from here with us tonight. We can do what the Bible says about this. We can make a difference. Think about reaching the lost with the gospel. One way is for us to monitor, modify our behavior. With that same behavior, magnify the great God. So I think you got a bell coming, and then there'll be some announcements, and I'll come back and explain what it is. Thanks for getting me with you today.
Good evening, everyone. Once again, it sure is good to be here. We are thankful for everyone's presence. I'm thankful to have Gary McDade speaking with us. Tonight, he gave an excellent lesson right out of the Bible. He read more verses out of the Bible than, uh, than you'd think that you could pack into about 40 minutes. So we're thankful for that. Uh, you stick into God's Word and uh, preach the truth. And it will change people's hearts. It is the power of God and salvation. So thank you for that. We do have several folks on our prayer list, and I would like to name those out. Just about everything is an update, so it'll be a little bit longer. Uh, Gary said that the invitation would only take about an hour and a half, so uh, we should be okay. We do want to keep uh, Noah and Kate and Fitzgerald in our prayer. They're going to be having surgery tomorrow. So keep them in your prayers. I also want to pray for Brandon Baggett. He's still in the hospital and not doing very well, so please keep Brandon Baggett in your prayers. Uh, also, Julie Dodd's sister, Rita Jones, uh, she's been taken off the ventilator twice, and both times they had to put her back on it because she can't breathe on her own, so please continue to keep her in your prayers. Uh, Edna has an appointment on August 4th with her nephrologist, but she also is going to have a heart cath on July 26th. We want to keep her in our prayers as she gets ready for this. Uh, Susan Kendrick will be going back to the doctor on July 26th and then 27th also for a follow-up, so keep her in your prayers. Ruth Crow is home from the hospital, but still weak, so keep her in your prayers. We also want to continue to remember Benton Fletcher and Sybil Clifton. Uh, Robbie Eversole, he is home. But he's having trouble with his medication. He's uh, having some nausea and he's just having a real tough time. So please keep Robbie in your prayers as he recovers from that surgery at home and he can get his medication straight down. We also want to remember Suge Childers. Uh, this is Jebby's friend. He's having a real tough time with an ankle surgery. We mentioned that on uh, Sunday. Also, Kathy Dennison uh, has been moved from Memorial Hospital into rehab. So Thankful for that move and want to pray for her as she goes through rehabilitation. Added to our prayer list tonight is Kristen Gephardt. Kristen's a member at Ottawa and she's recovering from a pretty serious surgery. So please keep her in your prayers as well. I have a card here that I'd like to read. There's so much good that this congregation does. When you get a card like this, it just really lets you know that there's people here in the faith care about people and, and encouraging them. It says, to the ladies, I just wanted to thank you all for the beautiful cards and prayers and to let you know you made my day. I put them all where I can see them and smile every time I look at them. Please keep me in your prayers, Alice and Melvin. So keep up the good work, ladies. You really, really do a good work, and it means a whole lot to people. Speaking of good news, uh, Rick Wilson was baptized into Christ on Sunday. And here he sits right here with us, and he's... He's back there smiling, I know. Uh, make sure that you welcome him. Uh, we are glad to have another brother in Christ. Just as a reminder, anyone that would like to donate dessert for the trip to Maywood need to have <clears throat> those in the fellowship room this Friday, July 15th. And we want to thank everyone in advance for that because we know you're going to sugar those kids up well. If you would like to help support one of the kids going, you can make that check out to the church here at LaFed and put Maywood Christian Camp in the four section. There is a notice on the bulletin board. I did get them put up for the uh, the Youth Ugly Sweater Christmas in July event. That will be at uh, Pleasant Grove on Saturday the 23rd. There is a uh, an RSVP. If you plan on going to that, you need to make call that number and make sure they know what to expect. Our youth activity this month will be July 29th. And that will be a lock-in. And also on July 29th, the annual singing at Pleasant Grove at 7 p.m. there at the Pleasant Grove Village. July 31st will be our uh, fellowship meal following our morning worship. Yeah, you can come back and have fellowship meal if you want to. It's good food, I promise. Uh, we'll have our afternoon service at 2 p.m. following that meal. That is all the announcements I have at this time. Uh, it's proper time, Randy Overby will offer a closing prayer. Looks like Junior's going to lead us in song. First song this evening will be page 118. 
I'm seeing the first and fourth standards of 118. Yeah, what I say. When upon the hills you are tempted to stop, when you are discouraged thinking of his loss, count your many blessings and their one by one, and it will surprise you what the salvation from the book of Romans. I like doing this because it's easy for us to remember and then it's easy for us to think something. Um, a couple of the, uh, one of the families there at Browns Ferry Road, we were studying and I go over the plan of salvation every time, but they're out on vacation with their friends and he's texting me and he's asking me questions in the text. I'm like, so I'm sending the answer. Ask me to send him the answer. And it's about the plan of salvation. And so I got him the answers that he needed, but I could just see him down under the table when they're eating, you know. <laughs> so when he got back, I said, what we need to be able to do is take a three to five card and write the plan of salvation down, put that in our pocket with the passage of scripture, and then pull it out, look at it occasionally, you'll get it. So when he walked up, we did, wrote down the plan of salvation, everybody had cards, and wanted to do that and did it. And going out of the auditorium that day, he said, I, I got you now. I got you. I got my card now. <laughs> well, a good way to do that, you don't have to write it down, is just remember that the plan of salvation is in the book of Romans, and I'll give you the passages of Scripture on hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. All about the The book of Romans is about the obedience of faith. Romans 1 5, Romans 10 16, Romans 6, 16 to 18, Romans 16, verse 26 and 27. The obedience of faith. And there are five steps to salvation contained in it that will bring you into the Church of Christ, Romans 6, 26, Church of Christ. So the first thing we need to do is hear the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. You might put verse 14 for that, and then you might put for the next one, hear and believe the gospel. You might put verse 17 for both of those. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. So those are the first two steps in the gospel plan of salvation. And sometimes we talk about how hard it is to repent. Sometimes it's hard for people to listen. It's hard for people to hear today. We've asked about, I don't know, there are 1,250 homes in Lookout Valley. We've been to all of them three times. We're trying to set up Bible studies and invite people to church services. We do that only occasionally. We should have hundreds of Bible studies. It's hard for people to listen. Here. Well, that first step is difficult, but that's the first step. Hearing and believing the gospel. The third step is repenting of sin. So in Romans 2 4, 
Paul affirms the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Now, that's not the only motivation for repentance, of course. Chapter 11, verse 22. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. But that verse says, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Romans 2, 4. So we hear the gospel, believe it, and repent of our sin. I'd like to give you a lesson on repentance because not many people are talking about it in our world today. You don't see on TV and radio anybody ever talking about repentance anymore. No. You don't see in the Southern Baptist Convention when there are 205 pages of offending ministers who are guilty of sexual sins in a congregation to the extent that they had to publish those names and reveal who those offending pastors are. 205 pages. It's on sbc.net, and I looked on there, scanning through it. One guy is in prison for 55 years. And when they're interviewing people at the head office in Nashville, the Baptist Sunday Convention, a lady spokesman says, you know, there's a word that we need in dealing with this. It's the word gentleness. Gentleness. you got... There's probably three to five people on each page uh, as you look at that list of offending pastors. And you need gentleness? No, you need repentance. You need repentance. Repent or perish. So, not even much about repentance. I'd like to give a lesson on repentance, but I'm just giving you the steps of repentance. I got you. So we move on. You have the goodness of God. Leave it in now then, once we have believed Christ as the Son of God and we're repenting of our sins, not just being sorry for our sins, but godly sorrow that worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but the soul of the world of death. A true repentance, a change of heart, is brought out into a change of the mind. Then we are to confess Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10, for your verse. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And there is your confession. And what did he do? He confessed Christ. Dr. Charles Stanley was on national TV two weeks ago, and he said the very first thing is for us to confess our sins. You don't confess your sins and you're an alien sin. You confess Christ from a dead man. I think about it this way. If that was the truth, and you got an old guy like me, and you're going to become a Christian now, and you confess your sins, do you think I could get that done in an hour and a half? Man lived all his life, sinning all his life, and he got to confess all his sins. Do you think anybody's patient enough to sit there and listen? Why would somebody need to be put through all of that? All of the aggression of a sinful, wicked life. No, you don't confess your sins. You may not even remember all your sins. Like something you put on your credit card five years ago and still ain't got it paid off. You don't know what you even bought with the thing. That's the way your sins, they pile up. Add sin to sin. I say it 30 bucks for you. No, you confess Christ. What is true, man? And then we are baptized in water for the remission of our sins. Romans 6. Romans 6, 1. And you get any of those verses in one, especially, we always like verses 3 to 5. All of them are good through the chapter. Where he says, Know ye not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. For like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together with him in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. All that chapter is great. Verse 3 to 5. Get the point across. Baptism into the death of Christ causes us to be raised to walk in a new life at that point. Not before, but at that point. So there are the five steps in the gospel plan of salvation. In Romans, hear and believe the gospel. Romans 10 and 17. Repentance seals, Romans 2, 4. Confess faith in Christ. We hear and believe, we repent of our sins, confess our faith in Christ. Romans 10, 92. And baptism in the cross, Romans 6. When we do that, the Lord adds us to his church. It's called the Church of Christ in Romans 16, 16. The churches of Christ salute you. I heard Brother Franklin Count say one time that most denominational preachers would give their right arm if they could find their church in the Bible. Here you go through life, you go to seminary, you study hard, 
you come out and you're preaching, you're doing your ministerial duties all of your life and you're in a church that's not in the Bible and you can't open your Bible and show you your church in the Bible, yet the entirety of your life is centered around that church, its system, its teaching, and its name, and it's not in the Bible. And you obey the gospel in the book of Romans. The Lord adds you to his church, the churches of Christ. Salute you. Romans 6 and 6. Tonight, you're not a member. The opportunity and privilege is yours. If you are a child of God and you have stumbled and fallen in such a way that you've sinned publicly, private sins are to be confessed to God in private. Public sins are to be confessed in public. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's not in Romans, that's James 5. That's heaven's invitation. Every one of us tonight need to be able to walk out those doors and get in our cars and go home and pillow our heads with the reassurance of the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. If you cannot do that, won't you respond to heaven's invitation now? While we together stand and sing this prayer. Uh, say that it was certainly great to be here tonight. I want to thank Brother Jerry again for coming our way, uh, presenting an outstanding lesson, wonderful devotion. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight and making this night a great success. Appreciate you so very much and uh, you are an encouragement to the entire congregation. Don't forget about those who are traveling to Maywood. We'll be leaving Saturday and coming back the following Saturday. Pray for us while we are over there because it is going to be hot. And so uh, pray for us for safe travel as we go there and come back. 
Don't forget about Sunday morning worship at 10 a.m. Morning or Bible study at 10 a.m. Morning worship at 11 and then evening worship at 5 p.m. And then next Wednesday, there will be another summer series speaker. So if there are no other announcements, we will be led in our dismissal prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful once again for the opportunity that you have given us to be here this evening. And the Father, we're just so thankful for the church here at Lafayette. We're thankful for what it means to this community. Him the Father, we're thankful for our leadership that we have here. We just ask Him the Father that you be with these men, help them, give them the wisdom to keep on having the truth in God. And the Father, we're thankful for Brother David and his ability to preach and teach. And we're thankful for him and his family and the Father. And then, uh, we ask Him the Father that you would be with our sick and been mentioned here tonight that be thy will that you would comfort them and help them and get them back to their health and the Father. And we ask that you be with all those that are about to have the seizures, that you would be with them and be with the doctors and the nurses and the Father. And also be with those that have lost loved ones, help them and care for them and help them as only as you can in the Father. And the Father, we're thankful for your son that is willing to die upon the cross for our sins in the Father. And May we have eternal life with you someday, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we are, we are thankful for this country that we live in, for all the many blessings that we have, and we know all our blessings come from thee, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this lesson that's been brought to us tonight, that be the one that has brought it to us, Heavenly Father, and help him and give him a long life in that service, Heavenly Father. And we're just thankful for, for all that has been taught here tonight, that we can use in our everyday life, Heavenly Father. Now, Heavenly Father, we're going through this week. We just ask that you be with us, keep us safe, and bring us back to the next time, Heavenly Father. Just give us a 